All right. Go ahead. Thank you, Judge. Good afternoon, everyone. On behalf of the state, I'm going to take this opportunity. It's really our first and only opportunity to thank you all for your attention going forward. We talked a lot yesterday about how long this trial is going to go. That's certainly not lost on us, what we're taking you all away from. And we appreciate it. I want you to know we've all worked hard to organize ourselves and make sure we can go through this as quickly and efficiently as possible over these next few weeks. That being said, there is a lot to unpack in a case like this. After I go through my, or while I go through my opening, you're gonna see almost two timelines. As I prepared for this, I kept seeing almost two timelines emerging. There's certainly a factual, bare bones timeline of theft, murder, and more theft. But there's this almost overlaid timeline of all of the defendant's lies and deceit on top of that bare bones timeline that's a little bit tricky to go through and process, but let's start it. So this is Wisconsin versus Jesse Kershewski. Said otherwise, this is a case of murder, greed, and lies. The judge just read you the three counts. Of course, in the law, we call murder intentional homicide, and that's count one. And it's a homicide or murder of Lynn Hernan. Count two is a theft of over $100,000 of Lynn Hernan. And those date ranges, January 1st of 2016 until October 3rd of 2018, really represent the theft while Lynn Hernan was still alive. And then count three is yet more theft, more greed, of theft of almost $87,000 from Lynn Hernan's estate from October 4th until July 9th of 2019 after her murder. We all come into court with ideas of what homicide or murder are and what a theft is, and certainly there's legal elements that have to be proved that the judge read to you, and we'll go through a bit more because as the party that has to prove each of those elements to you, I want to make sure you have a good understanding of what intentional homicide is, not just sort of the classic example of somebody shooting another individual in the head and killing them. It can be many things. In this case, a poisoning. But first, though I said this is a case against Jesse Kershewski, murder, greed, and lies, at the heart of this case, what I don't want to be lost on you, is this is a case about Lynn Hernan, the victim. So let's see who Lynn Hernan was. Lynn Hernan was an individual with a small but close group of friends. I think you're going to see as the evidence comes in that it was really two distinct groups of friends. On the one side was Ms. Kershewski and her mother, Jennifer Flower. On the other side was these individuals, Keith Lang, Kareen Poza, Jim Kelleher, and Anthony Poza. And you'll hear from many of them. Now, interestingly, Lynn Hernan was also an individual with no children of her own. So she sort of pseudo-adopted her friend, Jennifer Flowers' daughter, Jessie Kershewski, and did the same thing with Kareen Poza's son, Anthony. And you're going to hear that they were named the two beneficiaries of Lynn Hernan's will, or her estate, and we'll get into that a lot as well. Lynn was also a cat lover. That seems like a flippant thing I put on there, but it's actually very important because, and I'm fast forwarding a little bit, but at the very day of October 3rd, when police come and talk to Jesse Kershewski, they ask her point blank, do you think this could be a suicide? And her answer was, well, yes or no, I don't really know. I don't think Lynn would have left her cats. And that's what Anthony, Jim, and Corrine will also tell you. That Lynn was a person who didn't just love her cats like many people. She loved her cats. She was not going to leave her cats alone to fend for themselves or let somebody else come in and take care of these cats. The cat lover part is actually a very important part to all of this. While she loved cats, hated technology. Didn't own a computer. Didn't own a smartphone. Used a flip phone sort of when she had to. Didn't use email, had no email address of her own, had no way of checking it, didn't know how to check it. When she paid bills, it was with cash or over the phone, making transfers through the bank over the phone, or going in person to a branch and making a payment on a credit card or utility bill or something like that. You're going to see, and we'll get into pattern of life and what that is and what that means, but Lynn was not a person to go online and pay a bill. She was not checking her credit card statements online. She was not checking email. She was doing nothing. Had no computer or any device to access the internet. And frankly, 
dead at only 62 years old from a tetrahydrazoline poisoning after the defendant gave her a bottle laced with Visine eye drops to drink. So I told you we'd get into the legalities of what is intentional homicide. Right? The judge just read these. I'm not going to go through each part the judge just read you, but I am going to highlight that we have to prove to you that Ms. Kraszewski caused the death of Lynn Hernan. I want to highlight that her act has to be a substantial factor. And certainly here you're going to hear, really in the defendant's own words, that she gave Ms. Hernan a bottle of water that she knew to be filled with Visine eye drops. Second element, that Ms. Kraszewski was aware or intended to kill Lynn Hernan. And that can mean that she was aware or practically certain that her act was going to kill Lynn Hernan. We're going to show you that, again, with the defendant's own statement. And when she's talking to detectives after she's told, because there's many versions of the defendant's statement, and they constantly change as she gathers more information through law enforcement. But ultimately, she admits to giving that bottle with Visine in it for Lynn Hernan to drink. And when the detectives ask her, well, did you know that was going to kill her? She says, I was sick because I knew it could kill her. And you're going to hear that knowing that Ms. Kraszewski still left Lynn Hernan alone, left her house. In fact, you're going to hear that she didn't spend the day worried about Lynn. She was opening a JCPenney account in Lynn's name that same morning. And she was using other accounts of Lynn to go shopping, do some online shopping, while she knew she had just given Lynn poison. Let's talk about intent. Lynn Hernan's not here to tell you what went on on October 3rd, 2018. So you have to look at all of the defendant's acts, words, and statements. That's sort of subcategory one. And then over here, you have to look at all the facts and circumstances that were going on around October 3rd, 2018, for us to show you that Jesse Kraszewski did intend to kill Lynn Hernan. Again, the judge just read this to you, but it's important. We often hear motive in TV shows and movies. The state always talks about what was the motive, here's her motive. We don't have to prove motive to you. That's not something in those two elements. We do have to show intent. We don't have to show motive. As this instruction said, motive is often helpful. And here it's pretty simple. As we go through the financials fairly painstakingly, you're going to see that the access Ms. Kraszewski had to Lynn Hernan allowed her to steal every dollar almost that Lynn Hernan was worth in life. And knowing that she was going to be the personal representative of Lynn Hernan's estate, you're going to see that in or about October 3rd, 2018, Lynn Hernan became worth more dead than alive to Jesse Kraszewski. But it's important to note, intent is not the same as motive. The theft counts really go to that motive, but they're separate crimes. Again, here are the elements, verbatim from what the judge just read to you. I try as best I can in openings to let the jury know what I think your job is really going to boil down to. And so, with element one, that's going to be pretty simple for you. That Jesse Kraszewski intentionally transferred property of Lynn Hernan between January of 2016 and October of 2018. You're going to see and we're going to focus on 28 checks that were all written off Lynn Hernan's account to Jesse Kraszewski. By her cashing those, that's transferring property. That's just element one right there. This wasn't a bank error. This wasn't an, oh my gosh, it went into my account and I don't know who deposited this. This is just transferring property. That's element one, period. What becomes an issue is elements two and three. Again, did Lynn Hernan consent to those money transfers into the defendant's accounts? So that's kind of two and three rolled in together. And we'll talk about that going forward. Again, number four is going to be easy. I don't think you're going to have to spend much time worried about element four because it's going to be clear that the defendant never paid back any dollar amount to Lynn either while she was living. And even though she had access to the estate account as personal representative, she didn't put any money back into the estate that she said, oh, you know, when she died, I owed Lynn $144,000. So let me put that back in the estate. Not a single dollar went back to Lynn Hernan either alive or dead. So number four, absolutely, the defendant intended to permanently deprive Lynn Hernan of these monies. So let's talk about that consent. It's the same in count three. 
rather quickly, the estate. And this, as Ms. Kershevsky and Anthony Poza were the only two beneficiaries of Lynn Hernan's property at that point, really this becomes a theft from Anthony Poza. What should have happened was whatever Lynn Hernan's estate was truly worth gets split down the middle, and Jesse Kershevsky should have gotten half, Anthony Poza should have gotten the other half. Unfortunately, that's not what happened. Again, consent will be an issue for count four. The, uh, that should be transferred, I apologize about that. But the transfer of property in element one and the permanently deprived in element four will not be an issue. You're going to see numerous cash withdrawals that Ms. Kershevsky made from Lynn's estate account to herself where she's just taken out thousands of dollars, roughly $50,000 in cash withdrawals from the estate account. Again, never paid back. We're going to talk about an inheritance loan funding where essentially Ms. Kershevsky made an agreement with a company that said, I'll put up $10,000 of the inheritance I'm supposed to get if you give me $18,700 right now. And she paid that back and they refunded some of the money. She should have plugged that refund back into the estate. But the point is she took all that money out of the estate. She didn't wait for her inheritance to put that up. She didn't pay back any of the money. So we have roughly $50,000 in cash withdrawals. We have this sort of bogus loan fund that she takes for herself out of the estate, never paying anything back. And we have a number of checks again, written to either the defendant's own credit cards, to her mother's apartment rent, or just a cash for herself, to the tune of almost $87,000 out of the estate. Again, I included this again because for theft, just like for the intentional homicide, again, Lynn's not here to tell you what she consented to because she was murdered on October 3rd, 2018. So you have to, as jurors, look at what the defendant was doing around this time. What are all the facts and circumstances surrounding this time frame now of October 4th to July 9th of 2019? So going back to account one, I kind of talked about this. But we have this murder element to this case, right? Murder, greed, and lies. The murder part is that our own medical examiner for Waukesha County has been doing this for roughly 35 years. He's going to come in and tell you that as she did her job in this case, she determined the manner of death in this case to be homicide and that the cause of death was tetrahydrazoline poisoning. Now, she didn't come to that conclusion lightly. She didn't look at one sheet of paper and look at some autopsy photos and look at some scene photos and say, I got it. This case took a lot of time. This took months and months for Dr. Bidzricki to come to her conclusions. She consulted with Dr. Kosinko, who you'll hear from, from NMS Labs, regarding tetrahydrazoline in general, effects on the body when it's ingested and not just put in the eyes. Dr. B herself ordered several toxicology reports after the original one. She wanted to see more information, as much as she could get. So she was constantly sending lab work out for more toxicology reports. You'll hear she did her own research. She obviously got to see Lynn's body very close in time to October 3rd. And about that, she'll tell you that in her experience over that 35 years, she thought this death scene looked staged. She's been to a number of drug overdose deaths and the scenes, and she'll tell you that this one struck her as being staged. Because she'll tell you that people who legitimately overdose on drugs and end up killing themselves do not have piles of powder sitting on their chest. They don't have powder and pill fragments up in their hair. They don't have pills laying everywhere. They take everything. There's really nothing usually left behind. And so she'll tell you about her observations and why that stuck out to her as something being off about that initial crime scene. She'll obviously tell you about her autopsy and going through that. But by and large, my point is, this was not a, a quick decision she made to say, oh, it's probably a homicide, let's see how it plays out. This is diligent, thorough work Dr. Bidzricki did to reach her conclusions of homicide and cause of death being tetrahydrazoline poisoning. And she'll tell you there were other uh, drugs or substances in Lynn's system many pharmaceuticals, but she's still going to tell you that the overall cause of death was the tetrahydrosaline poisoning, eye drops. 
We know that the defendant, Ms. Kraszewski, killed Lynn Hernan again because eventually, <coughs> after her story changes a number of times, she admits to detectives that she knowingly gave Lynn Hernan a bottle filled with Visine. And as you can see, Visine has tetrahydrosoline. They're not synonymous, but when we talk about tetrahydrosoline in this case, we're oftentimes talking about Visine. Again, defendant had the intent to kill Lynn Hernan. This is, again, taken directly from the jury instruction as to what intent means. And there it is again. After admitting that she gave this bottle laced with Visine to Lynn Hernan, she told detectives she knew it could very well kill Lynn. And she still left, went shopping, opened other credit cards in Lynn's name while Lynn was dying of poisoning. So again, what are all the acts, words, and statements of the defendant? That kind of leads to my greed portion of this whole trial. As to count two, there's the total figure we're going to show to you, and that's for 28 checks from two different bank accounts of Lynn. Over $144,000 taken in about a two to two and a half year span of time. What you'll also see in that time is the defendant was getting paychecks direct deposited into her account. So you'll be able to see exactly what legitimate income she was making from her job when she was unemployed and not making any legitimate income <coughs> from a job. And over the same span of time, January 1st of 2016 to October 3rd, 2018, her total earnings through jobs at various dental offices was right around $49,000. Now, you're going to see that she absolutely needed to have this $144,000 because when we go through all of Ms. Kraszewski's credit cards, bank statements, spendings, you'll see that in that same time span, two and a half, almost three years, her earnings were $49,000, her total expenditures over $500,000. You're also going to see that on these 28 checks, I'm sorry, first of all, uh, this doesn't count. This $144,000 figure does not count all of Lynn's credit cards suddenly being maxed out and over their limit. It doesn't count a $30,000 loan that Ms. Kraszewski took out in Lynn Hernan's name after altering bank documents. We've lost the TV. <laughs> There we go. Thank you. All right. So, bottom line, by October of 2018, an account of Lynn Hernan's, which from 2014 until spring of 2016 held $250,000. Actually, there was about $500 of interest collected on that in those two years. By October of 2018, is down to $87.72. You're going to hear that of that significant chunk gone, Lynn Hernan made two rather large purchases for herself. In 2016, she bought herself a Jeep and paid for that out of this account. And she also bought herself some jewelry. You're going to hear that for much of Lynn Hernan's life, she lived paycheck to paycheck, dollar to dollar, until around 2014 when her mom died and left her $250,000 in inheritance. And so she buys herself a Jeep and she buys herself some jewelry that she ends up paying, she puts on a credit card, but pays down off this account with her inheritance in it. Beyond that, $134,000, more than half, is all 20 checks written to Jesse Krzyzewski. Of those 20 checks from that account, we'll keep going. Of those 20 checks, 19 of them have a very specific purpose written in the memo. Some say Cone, K-O-H-N, law office, some say Prosper Funding, some say America Advance, some say Citibank. The point is that you'll see the money leave Lynn Hernan's account, go into the defendant's account, and never do any amounts leaving Ms. Kraszewski's account go to those purposes. Deceit and greed. There's another account Ms. Hernan had that's down to $52 by October of 2018. Here we are. <laughs> but that involves 10 checks written to Ms. Kraszewski for another 
That represents that $144,000 figure. Okay, let's catch up here a little bit. And that's another point. Out of these 20 checks, there's a 21st check out of this account that's written to the Jeep dealership for Lynn's Jeep. Other than those 21 checks, not a single check will you see come out of Lynn Hernan's account to anybody else. This was not an account she was using. But Ms. Kersheski had access, and Ms. Kersheski knew that Lynn Hernan didn't have internet to easily check these things. Again, none of these amounts are ever paid back in life or in death to Lynn Hernan. So let's talk about patterns of life. I mentioned that before. Very quickly, as we go through uh, with Detective Plenis, all the financial statements, and there's quite a few of them, and again, we'll try our best to work through them efficiently but thoroughly for you, you're going to see patterns of Lynn Hernan emerge, right? I told you that most of her friends will even tell you, and it's substantiated by her financial statements. She was often a person to use cash. Her credit cards were not used very often. But when they were, they were generally at businesses like Pick and Save, in Waukesha, Speedway gas stations in Waukesha, uh, things of that nature. When she used her credit cards, they were paid down very quickly. Her credit score was up in the high 700s to low 800s for much of this time span we'll be talking about, January of 16 to October of 18. No online activity, no IP activity is on her accounts until approximately June of 2018 when Lynn's pattern of almost two years at that point that we can see starts to look a lot like Ms. Kraszewski's, where now all of a sudden we're seeing Lynn's credit cards being used a lot, balances not being paid down, or maybe just the bare minimum so that interest is piling up. We know that Ms. Kraszewski, as I said, she's earning $49,000 of legitimate income in this time, and she's spending well over $500,000. You're going to see that most of those purchases are ATMs, businesses in West Dallas, Hales Corners, and Franklin, specific businesses that were talked to about yesterday, Scotty's Pub and Stalas Palace being two of the most prevalent, but also Potawatomi. And you also see that there's frequent online activity. And Detective Plenis will tell you why that's important for law enforcement to recognize that when somebody's pattern of life switches to another person's pattern of life, what does that mean? What does that overlap? What does that change mean? And finally, defendants' acts, words, and statements. And this is to count three. Taking advantage of her role as the personal representative of Lynn Hernan's estate to steal over $87,000. Again, you're going to see numerous cash withdrawals. You're going to see checks to her own credit cards, checks to cash, and that inheritance loan funding of $18,700. And that brings us to the lies. And this goes on for a number of slides, and I promise you, I pared these down for opening statements. You're going to hear a number of others as this trial goes. But this is kind of that second timeline I'm talking about that goes back now and sort of lays over the bare bones time work. But in March of 2018, Detective Plenis and I are going to show you and talk a lot about clearly altered bank documents where Ms. Kersheski changed the name of the account holder to Lynn, changed the yearly earnings, changed any reference to spendings at Stalas Palace and Potawatomi, all to get a $30,000 loan in Lynn, I'm sorry, in Lynn Hernan's name, but went in to Jesse Kraszewski's account. You're going to see that it went in on March 8th of 2018. That same day, Jesse Kraszewski adds Lynn Hernan to her bank account as a secondary user, obviously so that this loan in Lynn Hernan's name can go into that account. Furthermore, in spring of 2018, and you're going to hear, and Scott Craig is the former boyfriend of Jesse Kraszewski. He was the boyfriend of Ms. Kraszewski until July 9th of 2019 when she was arrested. He'll tell you that he knew of Lynn, knew who Lynn Hernan was. He thought it was a woman that Jesse Kraszewski helped care for, a family friend of Jesse Kraszewski, but he never met her. And in spring of 2018, Ms. Kraszewski tells her boyfriend who she's living with who they've been in a relationship for three years, she tells him that Lynn is in a coma at Freighter Hospital. That's in sometime in spring of 2018, he remembers. Scott Craig will tell you that he believed 
on October 3rd, 2018, when Ms. Krzyzewski tells him over the phone that Lynn has passed away, Scott Craig believed that Jesse Krzyzewski was at Freighter Hospital in Lynn's hospital room. He remembers feeling bad, but ultimately not surprised because he thought this woman had been in a coma for five months and that it was sort of a natural outcome. Ms. Krzyzewski never came clean to Scott Craig. It wasn't until July of 2019 when detectives show up at his door and tell him that Lynn Hernan did not die in Freighter Hospital. She was not in a coma for five months. And you'll hear a jail call between Ms. Krzyzewski that she makes to her boyfriend a few days after her arrest, Scott Craig, where he's furious that she lied to him about such a huge thing. And you'll hear her try to say it's only one thing. It's only one thing. What's the big deal? On October 3rd, as we talked about, she's using Lynn Hernan's credit cards, even after giving her this bottle of poison. She's opening up a JCPenney card. She's using that JCPenney card immediately after opening it, about 10.30 in the morning. We move to October 8th of 2018. She goes and picks up Lynn Hernan's jewelry from the medical examiner's office, and within two weeks, is selling three pieces of jewelry to Robert Hack. And what's interesting about this is that Robert Hack makes you declare how long you've owned an item before they're just going to let you sell it, right? They don't want people just taking things that aren't theirs and coming in and selling it and getting the money. Ms. Krzyzewski fills out three separate forms saying one of these items that she picked up two weeks ago, she's owned for two and a half months. Another one that says she owned it for three or three and a half months. And the third piece she says she has owned for six months. Moving to later in October and early November of 2018, you're going to see that there's even more credit card activity for Lynn Hernan's uh, credit cards, weeks after she's dead. In January of 19, here's another big one that involves Scott Craig. He wakes up one day to hear from Ms. Krzyzewski, who went out the night before. There's a big text message conversation where she's claiming she feels very sick and thinks she was drugged at the bar last night. She elaborates and she goes on to say, I had to go to the hospital, this is very serious. And she says, in January of 2019, and it's important to know that Dr. Bedzricki had not yet made a determination of the cause of death to be tetrahydrazoline poisoning. And the detectives had not told Ms. Krzyzewski what that cause of death was because it hadn't been made yet. And yet here she is telling her boyfriend that she's at the hospital and the doctors had her run tests and that she is found to have been poisoned by tetrahydrazoline. She doesn't say eye drops. She doesn't say visine. She says, they found tetrahydrazoline in my system. She tells her boyfriend that this is serious. This can kill you. In July, fast forward to July 9th of 2019, when detectives now tell Ms. Krzyzewski that Lynn died of tetrahydrazoline poisoning, she seems shocked and then says, I didn't even know you could die from that. Months after telling her boyfriend, this is serious, you can die from this. Next to February of June of 2019, the police will tell you all about how they go through people's phones. They went through Scott Craig's phone. They went through Jesse Krzyzewski's phones. They went through some other phones and they download them. And they're good at getting everything they can, including some deleted things. And lo and behold, on Ms. Krzyzewski's phone, between February and June of 2019, they find a number of documents that she deleted from her phone. The subjects are, quote, criminal poisoning, cyanide poisoning, and household poisons. Those all show in the phone download that they were accessed, I mean, somebody opened them on her phone in July of 2018. Moving to April of 2019. Anthony Poza, who I told you earlier, was like uh, sort of an adopted son to Lynn. He's the other beneficiary on the will. So Ms. Krzyzewski has to run everything by him, and he has to sign off on things before she can close the estate. He feels like something's off. He doesn't think something's right, and he asks to see receipts. And a few weeks later, Ms. Krzyzewski sends him 52 pages of receipts or invoices. Detective Plenis will talk to you at length about how he went through each one of them. Some of our witnesses will be very fast witnesses who will look at a receipt or an invoice that was given to Anthony Poza, and they will tell you, this is not our company's invoice at all. This is completely made up. 
Detective Plenis looked into all the financials. If Ms. Kershevsky claimed to pay off a credit card of Lynn Hernan, Detective Plenis looked at it and found it to be false. Almost all of these 52 pages are completely false documents that were given to Anthony Poza by Ms. Kershevsky. Conveniently, about a month or less after she purchased Adobe Acrobat on one of her credit cards that we'll show you. And finally, more lies. When she talks to detectives in both March and July of 2019, her story changes a number of times, and Detective Hoppy is going to tell you all about those. But even on the scene, I told you before, her initial statement to the scene officer, who just said point blank, you call this in, Ms. Kraszewski, you're friends with Lynn Hernan, do you think this could be a suicide? She doesn't say, yes, absolutely. Lynn was suicidal for a long time, and what a tragic ending. She says, I don't, yes and no. I don't think she'd leave her cats. In March of 2019, she writes an email to one of the detectives on the case and says in that email she has a hard time believing Lynn would commit suicide. Okay? Now July of 2019, she's arrested. She's told this is a poisoning and that police now know the medical examiner has deemed this a homicide and they don't think it's a suicide. Now, Ms. Kershevsky starts claiming that Lynn was suicidal for months leading up to October of 2018. She still denies helping any way or knowing anything about Visine many times. Ultimately, then her story changes again. She says, okay, well, one time I put two drops of Visine in a glass of water for her because I just knew that she was drinking Visine. But that's it. That's all. To ultimately stating, again, that quote, she finally gave that water bottle knowing it had, in the defendant's estimation, six bottles of Visine to Lynn Hernan, knowing it could kill her and walks out of that condo unit, closes the door, and goes shopping on Lynn's dime. And then that leads into a law enforcement goose chase, I'll call it, where Detective Hoppy will tell you, I suspect with some frustration in his voice, about more lies, Ms. Kraszewski told law enforcement, starting with, you guys, there's a recording from Lynn, there's suicide letters, there's all this evidence that'll show I'm, I'm not guilty of any of this. There's evidence out there, there's evidence out there. It starts with this storage shed. She says, check a storage shed. Detective Hobby says, where's the storage shed? And very quickly, Ms. Kraszewski goes, kind of laughing, says there was never a storage shed. I was gonna get a storage shed, never did, but that's what I was going to, but there's no storage shed. So next, she tells Detective Hoppy, we have to check a BMO Harris bank lockbox. And the detectives do. They did before, and they learn that it's empty. There's nothing in there. They also learn that Ms. Kraszewski and her mom, Jennifer Flower, were the last ones to access that bank box, and just so happened to do so on October 4th, 2018, the very day after Lynn died. So when Ms. Kraszewski is telling Detective Hoppy to check the lockbox, she already knows it's empty because she was there, and she was the last one there the day after Lynn died. So that doesn't work. So she now changes to say, well, I buried a lot of stuff in Whitnell Park, kind of by the Nature Center. And Detective Hoppy will tell you that another detective was out there in Whitnell Park with a metal detector and a shovel. They're trying to use video access to have Ms. Kraszewski tell us where in the world do we find these things. Spoiler alert, they found nothing. There was no magical, mysterious hole at Winnell Park. Just more lies from Ms. Kraszewski. And finally, in October and November of 2019, Ms. Kraszewski is removed by the court as personal representative of Lynn's estate, mostly because of this investigation. She takes that and says, well, now there's a real will I have to file. Almost a year to the day, almost, of filing the actual original will. It's notarized by two impartial people. Ms. Kraszewski now files a, quote, real will. And wouldn't you believe it removes Anthony Poza as a beneficiary? You're going to hear from Paul Nowakowski, the register in probate of Waukesha County, and you're going to hear from Beth Taylor, an attorney who's done probate work for 25 years. They have never seen somebody file a, quote, unquote, real will a year after. And they've certainly never heard it being done as a test. Because that's what Ms. Kraszewski says. She says, I filed that will originally, and this was all a test, 
Anthony Poza was supposed to pass, and he failed because he questioned what I spent things on. And lo and behold, she tries to leave herself as the sole beneficiary of what's left of the estate that she stole from. Just more lies. That leads me, and I think this is my second to last slide. But when we look at all those facts and circumstances, when you're talking about what was Ms. Krzyzewski's intent, did she have that intent to kill, and what was her knowledge and intent as it related to the theft, remember the instruction says you have to look at all the facts and circumstances. And here they are pretty simply, I think. Between January of 16 and October 3rd of 2018, Ms. Krzyzewski was able to steal $144,000 plus from Lynn Hernan while she was still alive. Ms. Krzyzewski got it to a point where Lynn Hernan, as of October 8, 2018, lost almost all of that $250,000, right? It was down to $87. Now that she's worth nothing, her credit cards are maxed out, her bank account, one of them's at $87, another one's at $52. She's worth nothing, unfortunately, to Ms. Krzyzewski. But her estate is valued at approximately $150,000. And Ms. Krzyzewski helps herself to $87,000 of that. Lynn Hernan's murder falls so conveniently for Ms. Krzyzewski as to when she could maximize her profit off Lynn Hernan. But this is not a suicide. This was intentional homicide. So I come back to what I told you was the heart of this case. Lynn Hernan. And justice for Lynn Hernan here is three guilty verdicts for Jesse Krzyzewski. And that's what the state is asking you to return here. Thank you. We'll take another quick uh, sand break.